All perambulators lead to the Kensington Gardens. Why? Because, David, all children in our part of London were once birds in the Kensington Gardens. That's why there are bars on nursery windows and tall fenders by the fires. Why? Sometimes very little people forget they no longer have wings and they try to fly back there. Was I once a bird then? Definitely. What kind? Was I a little white bird? Oh, no. Little white birds are the children that grown ups don't have, the birds that never find a mother. You were a songbird, a mizzle thrush. Well, how did Mother choose me? I suppose she sent a letter to Solomon Kaur on the Serpentine Island asking for you, and he decided. No, but really, Father, how did she? Really, really? And how do you know her? How did it all really begin? One day, when that little boy who sometimes calls me father, though I am not his father, was about five, I sent him the following letter Dear David, if you really want to know how it all began, will you come and have a chop with me today at my club? Mary, his mother, who opens all his letters, gave her consent, as I knew she would, for despite her curiosity, she doesn't know exactly how it began herself. David came to me dressed as for a mighty journey, and looking unusually solemn, as little boys always do when they're wearing a great coat. There was a muffler round his neck. You can take that off when we come to summer. Shall we come to summer? To many summers, for we are going away back to see your mother as she was in the days before there was you. Cabby! Yes, Captain! Drive back six years and stop at the junior old fogies club. The streets were not quite as they had been in the morning. For instance, the bookshop at the corner was now selling fish. I dropped David a hint of what was going on. It doesn't make me little, does it? It won't make me too little, will it? He slipped his hand nervously into mine, and I put it in my pocket. The Little White Bird by J.M. Barry. Dramatized for radio by John Peacock. With Michael Siberi as Captain Wallace and Joe Absalom as Peter Pan. As I enter the smoking room, you are to imagine David vanishing into nothingness and that it is a particular rainy Thursday, six years ago, at two in the afternoon. Coffee, cigarette and cherry brandy, will you? Yes, sir. I take my chair by the window, just as the absurdly pretty little nursery governess, who was to be David's mother, comes down the street. I always feel I have rung for her. She is very pretty. Every day of the week, except Thursday... She passes the window, taking the two children she's in charge of to play in St. James's Park. But on Thursday, when she has two hours free, she meets the man who loves her and who will be your father outside the post office. So why does she look so unhappy? Because she thinks her heart is breaking. She's quarrelled with him. Whatever has been their quarrel, he is as upset and as anxious to make it up as she is. How do you know that? Because if you look across to that corner of Pall Mall, you can see him. They're both watching the post office, hoping to catch sight of each other. But from where they are, neither can see the other. Shall we make them happy again? Whatever the future cost. How do we do that? What if I were to take this letter, stumble accidentally, and drop it unseen at his feet? What would he do, do you think? Is there a stamp on it? Yes. Then I expect he'd cross over to the post office and post it. Exactly. What were the names of the children she looked after? I don't know. How do you know they were going to the park? They had hoops. Well, they iron hoops or just wooden hoops. But this is not the point of the story. You don't seem to understand. What I'm trying to tell you is that if I do not drop that letter, they will never be a David. I am the person responsible. But for me, they would never have been you. Does that mean I'd still be a bird flying around in the Kensington Gardens? Oh, please don't drop the letter. Think of your mother. I'd often fly back to see her. But think how sad she'd be without you. Why, I know. 
I would hop onto her pillow and peck her mouth. And then she'd wake up and find that she only had a bird instead of a boy. Oh, yes. Very well. You can drop it. Which is just as well, for I did drop the letter, as I think I've already mentioned. And that is how it all began. The next time I saw my little governess was some months later. I found myself walking behind her as she carried an enormous parcel that might have been a birdcage wrapped in brown paper. She went into a pawnbroker's shop and left without it. I went in. Good morning. I was looking for China, but I... Ah, what have you there? A very pretty doll's house. This very minute taken by me from a lady who has no further use of it. Well, the paint is a little worn and faded. Oh, well, it has been very much loved. I... I would like to return it to the lady. You are a good friend of hers? I am acquainted. I would like to redeem it for her. You have her name and address? We have, sir. Here we are. Would you return it for me? It will be a pleasure. I will pay the postage and write a letter to go with it. Dear Madam, I wrote... Don't be ridiculous. You will certainly have further use for this and must not part with it. I am your humble servant, the man who dropped the letter. As I wrote, I made a note of the address. She will be very pleased. Mary is her name. She sold it between you and myself because she has just got married. A new house, new beginnings. Three weeks later, for it took me that long to pluck up the courage... I found myself standing outside that same house where the couple lived. It was a droll house, a biscuit box that had once been an open passage to the back gardens of the houses on either side. The general effect was of a brightly coloured van that had become stuck forever on its way through the passage. A large sign announced, This space to be sold. Five minutes after seeing Mary and her husband leave the house, I was admitted by an elderly, somewhat dejected-looking female whose fine figure was not on scale with her surroundings. Perhaps my face said so. They get me cheap because I drink. Oh. Yes. Well, this is the parlour. But from what I see, ma'am, your master must be in affluent circumstances. <laughs> it's all tinned meats. Gets the house for next to nothing on the understanding that they leaves the premises sharp if anyone, like your good self, buys it for building on. Nevertheless, this room must have cost a pretty penny. She's done it all herself. This green floor so beautifully stained. What you can't do with boiling oil and a shilling's worth of paint. Those rugs? Remnants. The curtains? Remnants. At all events, the sofa. See? Made of packing cases. Uh, the desk. She made it out of three orange boxes. There is a fine chandelier in that Holland bag. Well, now... Now, don't say a word. How much to be pitied, ma'am, are those who have lost faith in everything? I prefer to believe what I think is inside that bag. Well, there's more of the same upstairs. So there is a staircase. Did she make that as well? No, but she's altered it. How she alters everything. Do you think you're safe, ma'am? Many paintings. Master is an artist. He has no difficulty in painting the pictures. He's getting the frames. Can't honestly say I think much of them myself. Nor does anybody else, for that matter. They're all tinned meats. This one's framed. Fancy portrait of our dear unknown. That's a friend of hers, but I never seed him. Uh, a friend of hers? That's right. How do you know if you've never seen him? When Master was painting it in the studio, he used to come running in here to say to her such like as, what colour would you make his eyes? And her reply, ma'am? Beautiful blue eyes. And he would say, you wouldn't make it a handsome face, would you? And she says, a very handsome face. And says he, middle-aged. And says she, 29. And I mind him saying... A little bald on the top? And she says, says she, not at all. How kind she must be. I've seen her kiss her hand to that picture. Yes? How long has she known him? Since she were a kiddie, I think. For this here, <clears throat> under the table, was a present he gave her. Newly painted it, she has. Dolls and all. Feel it. Paint's hardly dry. A doll's house. 
I'm ready for a child, a little girl. I wouldn't know about such things. That would be for her to say. P- put it back, please. So, am I to tell them you have interest in the space? No, not at all. Uh, It doesn't suit my purpose. I left the house dejectedly, but with a profound conviction that my little nursery governess had grown quite fond of her dear unknown. Four months later, the father about to be and I spoke for the first time. It was late at night, when I found him standing outside the house, gazing anxiously at the upstairs window where a lamp burned steadily, and where the little governess lay in waiting. I brought mother and father together, and somehow the anxiety of the occasion became my own. However it came about, maybe from my concern, he conceived the idea that I, too, was soon to become a father. I let his mistake pass. It seemed to matter so little, and to draw us together so naturally. I dare say you have many relatives waiting to welcome the infant. Uh, No, neither of us has family. And you? Me? Oh, no, no, not at all. We have no family, but we have a friend. An unknown friend. Mr. Anon, my wife calls him. (laughs) Without him, we would never have reached this day. Ah. He brought us together and has supported us throughout. He was the first person to buy a painting of mine. And a doll's house for the child, before any sign of one. Curious. Hmm. It is she who insists it is always the same person. She thinks he will make himself known to me if anything happens to her. She told me if she died tonight while bringing our young one into the world, I must discover him and give him her love. Well, as you know, the little nursery governess did not die. At 18 minutes past midnight, there was the rustle of David's wings. I shook the father by the hand and returned to my home. Home. As if one alone can build a nest. I wandered from chamber to chamber, followed by my great dog, Portos. Both alike and desolate. Oh, Portos. I often envisage what would be my position now had I not dropped the letter if I had but crossed the street myself to comfort that little governess. How you could be heard crying, David, morning, noon and night, whatever time I pass along your street. Portos and I visited the Lowther Arcade to find a toy that would soothe you and let your mother rest. It was sent anonymously to the Biscuit Box House. Captain Wallace, I've been longing to catch you. Is it all right? Both doing well? Both? Mother and child. Oh, yes, yes. Boy or girl? Boy. Ah, splendid. (laughs) Congratulations. What did you call your little girl? It was a boy. We call him David. And the name of yours? Oh, it's Timothy. Ah, Timothy, eh? (laughs) Timothy is as good a name as David. Yes, extremely so. I like it. I hope they'll become firm friends. My David and your Timothy. (laughs) How much did he weigh? Oh, um, well, he was about, uh, well, so big... A few pounds. Ah, Eight pounds, four ounces, my boy. And mother, is she well? Oh, so-so. You know how it... (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I do. Oh, you remember I told you about our anonymous friend, always sending presents? Well, his latest is to send David a rocking horse. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Imagine a rocking horse for a child not three months old. (laughs) Mary laughed so much. (laughs) She did? (laughs) But women are damned odd. The moment I laughed with her, she became all huffy. I see nothing to laugh at, she said, and kissed the horse solemnly on the nose. And I wish she was here to see me do it. (laughs) Well, that's women for you. Whatever, she's sworn to hunt our Mr. Anonymous down. Oh, she won't succeed. (laughs) Then it will be her first. Failure. But she knows nothing about the man. Oh, you wouldn't say that if you heard her talking of him. She says he's a lonely, whimsical old bachelor. Old? Well, what she says is he will soon be old if he doesn't take care. He's a bachelor at all events and is very fond of children but doesn't know what they want. Not used to playing with them. How the deuce does That's she... what she says. I think she'll prove to be too clever for him. Pooh. Uh, what would you like today, sir? Um, devil kidney, William. Did, did you say devil kidney, sir? William, you're not attending to me. I beg pardon, sir, but I was thinking of something else. For God's sake, 
So, as we are man and man, tell me if you've seen a little girl looking up at the club windows. Man and man? But he had been a good waiter. Not as yet. Well, thank God. Bread, William. Oh, um... Yes, sir. You are not vexed with me, sir. It was a liberty. Well, I know, sir, but I'm beside myself. But that's another liberty. Well, it's my wife, sir. She's ailing, sir. So uh, what's her confounded ailment? Well, she was always one of the delicate kind, but full of spirit. And you see, sir, she's had a baby girl lately and... Uh, oh, she has? Yes, sir. And, and there's an epidemic in our street and the kitty has had to be sent to the country. It's not possible. I've hardly known what I was doing all day, sir. I, I, I beg your pardon for speaking of her, but Irene, that's me eldest, had promised to come every two hours, and when she never came, it sort of blinded me, sir. And I stumbled against a member, uh, Mr Beecher, and he said, Damn you! Well, sir, I had but touched him, after all, and I was so broken, it sort of stung me to be treated so, and I lost me senses. And I said, Damn you! I'm being turned out of the dining room at once, until the committee have decided what to do with me. Oh, sir... I, I'm willing to go on my knees to Mr Beecher. How could I but despise a fellow who would be thus abject for a pound a week? For if I have to tell her I've lost me place, I don't know what will happen. Beecher, um, what's all this about your swearing at one of the waiters? You mean about his swearing at me? Oh, I'm, I'm glad that was it, for I couldn't believe you guilty of such bad form. The version I heard was that you swore at each other and that he was to be dismissed and you reprimanded. Who told you that? Well, as you're aware, I'm on the committee. Um, do you know, I, I fancy that I was wrong in thinking that the waiter swore at me and I shall withdraw the charge tomorrow. Excuse me, Captain... There's a young girl looking up at the window. Rather a low sort. Ah, yes. That will be Irene. You're acquainted? Ah, William. Ah, sir, Mr Beecher is going to inform the committee that he was mistaken in thinking you used improper language to him, so you'll doubtless be restored to the dining room tomorrow. Oh, sir, I... Can... Remember your place, William. <sighs> But Mr Beecher knows, I swore. Gentlemen cannot remember for more than a moment what a waiter says to them. No, sir, but... Then, uh, William, your wife is decidedly better. She's eaten the tapioca, all of it. How can you know, sir? Oh, by an accident. Well, Irene signed to the window? No. Well, th then you saw her and you went out and... How dare you, William? William knew that I regarded thanks from persons of his class as an outrage. Sir, to do that for me, may God bless... William! Yes, sir. Oh, William! Uh, how is the child? Oh, very well, sir. Uh, apart from a little colic. Ah. Now, what do you do about that? Oh, uh, three months and already twelve pounds. <laughs> Timothy's fourteen or thereabouts. Oh. <laughs> uh, he has a little colic, but the gripe water soon settles it. Yeah best thing. However, there is an epidemic in the area, so we're thinking of sending him to the country for a week or so. Oh, yes. We too. Uh, you don't happen to know anyone who has a St. Bernard dog, do you? Why? Look, he has a St. Bernard dog. He? Mr. Anon. How have you found that out? Mary has. Yes, but how? I don't know. But that rocking horse I told you about cost three guineas. She went to the shop to ask? Not to ask that, but for a description of the purchaser's appearance. <laughs> Not at all the handsome young man my wife envisaged. Really? <laughs> Looked like a military gentleman. Tall, dark and rather dressy. Fine Roman nose. Quite so. Carefully trimmed moustache going grey. Hair thin and thoughtfully distributed over the head like fiddle strings, as if to make the most of it. Aged 45 if a day. Oh, and he had an enormous dog with him. Ah, well. Do you know anyone who's like that? My dear man, I know almost no one who is not like that. He sounds like any member of my club. Ah, Miss Irene. Uh, how is your mother today? What does the doctor say about your mother? He says she would have a chance if she could join our kid in the country. Yes, well then, why doesn't William take her? My! Why don't we all drink champagne and porty wine? Oh, I see. A few days afterwards, I saw Mary accompany her husband as far as the crossing, whence she waved him out of sight as if he had boarded an Atlantic liner. Suddenly she was gone. 
With one mighty effort and a last terrified look round, she popped into the pawn shop. I waited for her to emerge and followed her straight to a baby linen shop, so it was plain for what she needed the money. I presume I would have chosen the easy way had time been given me, but fate willed that I should meet the husband on his homeward journey the same day, and his first remark... Uh, how's Timothy? ...inspired me to folly. He is no more. My dear fellow. Taken from me two weeks ago. After you sent him to the country? Damnable. Yes. I say, I really am so sorry to hear that. Yes. I only wish that before he went he could have played just once in these gardens and have ridden on the fallen trees or sailed one paper galleon on the round pond. I'm so sorry. But I shall ever hold that had he been quite like other boys, there would have been none braver than my Timothy. Of course. Is there anything I can do for you? I don't think there's anything anyone can do. There are so many little things in the house that are now hurtful for me to look upon. Mm. I, I can't sell them. I, I do have a friend with a young child who'd be glad of them, but he doesn't want to be reminded of Timothy. Why don't you let me take them from you and dispose of them? Thus, my new scheme found me in a hired landau, holding a newspaper before my face, lest anyone should see me in company of a waiter, his wife, and family. William was taking them into Surrey to stay with an old nurse of mine. Irene was with us, all but hidden beneath a mountain of baby linen purchased by me, wearing the most outrageous bonnet, also purchased by me, as a thank you. I have never known a bolder hussy than this Irene. Ooh, you know who gave me this bonnet? It was the pretty gentleman over there. Kitty wants to kiss the pretty gentleman. Irksome as all this was to a man of taste, I suffered still more acutely when we reached our destination, where disagreeable circumstances compelled me to drink tea with a waiter's family. Well, sir, we will wash these new kitty clothes. <laughs> And Irene here will get them back to you. Oh, it's a queer thing to be asked to do, but I promise you they will look as second-hand as we can get them with a little active ill-treatment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nigh on time for me to be catching the train back. Can't have the gentlemen doing without their marrow bones, can we? <laughs> I had something to say to William, which I feared he would misunderstand. William, the head waiter asked me to say that you could take a fortnight's holiday. Your wages will be paid as usual. Oh, oh sir. I, I, Confound him. I, I really William, th go away. Then I saw his wife signing him off also, and I realised she wanted to be left alone with me. William, stay where you are. But he had gone into the next room, and I was left alone with a woman whose eyes were filmy. Oh, sir, I, I can't say. Um, if you please, um, ma'am. It can only be the memory of some woman that makes you so kind to me and mine. I should like to know her name, sir, that I may mention her with loving respect in my prayers. Julia. Her name is Julia. Oh. She has a home and family, as you have, and I have none. Perhaps, ma'am, it would be better worth your while to mention me in your prayers. I sent the garments to the biscuit box two days later, but Chagrin came in the morning to my address with a letter from Mary. Dear sir... I know that you are my Mr. Anon, and that there never has been a Timothy. I was never so graveled. You are indeed my good fairy. David loves you already, and my husband, who is very proud of your friendship, has suggested that you pay him your first visit today at three o'clock. An hour at which I happen to know he is always giving painting lessons. I sent her a stiff and tart reply, declining to hold any communication with her at any time whatsoever. It is a painful thought that this man in the elbow chair by the fire, his hair thoughtfully distributed over his head like fiddle strings, talking to his dog and humorously known at his club as a confirmed spinster, was once gloriously happy. But I remember him when he was twenty-four the proudest subaltern of my acquaintance and with the most reason to be proud. Julia. I loved her, while wondering why she could give herself in marriage to me. It may be that I wandered over much. Perhaps that was why I lost her. I groped for reasons until I wearied of myself. All I know is that one day she ceased to love me, 
and began to love another. I won her love, but I couldn't keep it. She knew no more than I why this had happened, and when at last she had to leave, it was with compassionate cries and little backward flights. The dreams of the son we always talked of. Our Timothy. Gone. The failure, I felt, was all mine, but I should not have been so affected had I known how it came about. This puzzle has done me more harm than the loss of her. I have never since dared open up my heart to another woman. All perambulators lead to the Kensington Gardens. I sometimes saw David there, where he lorded it surrounded by his suite and wearing the blank face and glass eyes of all carriage people. On these occasions, I always stalked by, meditating on higher things. Irene, who had become his nurse, I forget how, but I fear I had something to do with it, ran after me with messages. Captain Wallace! Ah. She's at home with him. Why won't you go and see her? Why don't you drop in at 12-ish? Father's not there. No, Irene. David said his best at 12. No, I will not. Oh, you're ever so hard-hearted. She's grateful, only trying to be friendly. <laughs> he says tick-tack to the clock. <laughs> Other tots just say tick-tick. I prefer tick-tick. When I was his age, I was running about. Then one day... I allowed myself to see David properly for the first time. Just me and the tot for half an hour. I approached the perambulator and whistled softly. But he took no notice. I coughed, <clears throat> but still there was no response. It would ill become me to attempt to describe this dear boy, for I know really nothing about children. So I shall only say that I thought him very like what... Timothy would have been had he ever had a chance. Then he held up his foot, which had a gouty appearance, owing to its being contained in a dumpy little worsted sock. What does he want? Well, he wants you to take his socks off. But if he does take your socks off, my pretty may be blasted forevermore. Oh, go on then. There. David raised his bare foot and ran his mouth along the toes like one playing a barbaric instrument. It's his trick. Oh, he thinks he's playing his harmonica. He wants you to do something now. I was suddenly reminded of my famous manipulation of the eyebrows, forgotten since I was in the fifth form. I alone had been able to raise and lower my eyebrows separately, like two buckets in a well. The smile broke through the clouds. It was so pleasant assuming the air of one who walked with David daily, when to my chagrin I saw Mary approaching with quick, stealthy steps and already so near me that flight would have been ignominy. Captain Wallace, forgive me. I was not aware you were here. I merely raised my hat, and at that she turned quickly to David and lowered her face to his. Oh, little trump of a boy, instead of kissing her, he seized her face with one hand and tried to work her eyebrows up and down with the other. Nectar. I don't understand what you want, darling. Do you know, Irene? Looks as if he's after your eyebrows, Mum. I'd say he don't want the captain to go. In my great moment, I had the strength of character to raise my hat and walk slowly away. I turned my head and saw David fiercely pushing the woman aside to have one last long look at me. He held out his arms and I faltered, but I walked on. And who's had your socks off? He then began to howl. Really, Irene? It was a scheme conceived in a flash and ever since pursued. To burrow under Mary's influence with her son, expose her to him in all her vagaries, and to make him mine also. All perambulators lead to the Kensington Gardens. Not, however, that you will see David in his perambulator, for he is now much older. I see David two or three times at least every week, his mother having instructed Irene that I was to be allowed to share him with her, and Irene and I have become close friends. I invented many stories for David, practicing the telling of them by my fireside, as if they were conjuring feats, while Irene knew only one, but she told it 
as never has any other fairy tale been told in my hearing. And then Cinderella sits down like, and she tries on the glass slipper, and it fits her to a T. And then the prince, he cries in a ringing voice, This here is my true love, Cinderella, what now I makes my lawful wedded wife. You see, David, er, as was only a kitchen drudge, but as true and faithful in word and deed, such was her reward. It is a dead secret, a Drury Lane child's romance, but what an amount of heavy artillery will be brought to bear against it in this sad London of ours. Not much chance for her, I suppose. Good luck to you, Irene. Meanwhile, I and David began to tell our own stories. You see, David, the Serpentine begins here. It's a lovely lake, and there is a drowned forest at the bottom of it. If you peer over the edge, you can see the trees all growing upside down. And they say that at night, there are also drowned stars in it. In the middle of the lake is an island on which all the birds are born that become baby boys and girls. No one can visit, but you may write what you want, boy or girl, dark or fair, on a piece of paper, and then twist it into the shape of a boat and slip it into the water, and it reaches there after dark. Who lives on the island? No one who is human except Peter Pan. And he is only half human. Who is Peter Pan? He's ever so old, but is always the same age. What age? One week. How is that? He escaped from being a human when he was seven days old. He escaped and flew back to the Kensington Gardens. And how do you think he got out? Through a door? No. Up a chimney? Or rather... Through a window? Yes. Standing on the ledge, seeing the trees of the gardens far away, he forgot that he was a little boy in a nightgown, and away he flew. He couldn't fly without wings. Well, no, but the place where they used to be itched tremendously, and... and... perhaps we could all fly if we were as dead confident sure as was Peter Pan that evening. Was it after lockout time? Yes. I expect the fairies called out the guard. That's exactly what they did. Queen Mab's Regiment of Lancers. Left, right, 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 left, right. He tried to catch a fly, but missed. It's only just a human. He thinks he's a man. He's little more than a week old, leaving. He'll not survive the night. Peter sat down and cried. He didn't realise that he didn't sit down like other birds, which is a blessing, for if he had realised he wasn't a bird, he would have lost his power to fly. And the moment you doubt you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. To have faith is to have wings. So what did he do? He summoned all his strength and flew to the island in the Serpentine to put his case before the wise crow, Solomon Kaur. But you're not a bird. I am. Look at your nightgown, if you don't believe me. And the birds sleeping around us. How many have clothes? None. But I am, I tell you. I am a bird. How many of your toes are thumbs? None. My toes are fingers. You see? Ruffle your feathers. I think I should go back to mother. Goodbye. Why don't you go? I suppose... I suppose I can still fly. Poor little half and half. You will never be able to fly again. Not even on windy days. You must live here on the island always. And never even go to the Kensington Gardens. How could you get across? I promise to teach you as many of the bird ways as can be learned by one of such an awkward shape. Then I shan't be exactly a human. No. Nor exactly a bird. No. What shall I be? You will be forever a betwixt and between. <laughs> Shelley was a young gentleman, and as grown up as he need ever expect to be. He was a poet, and they are never exactly grown up. They are people who despise money except what you need for today. And he had all that, and five pounds over. 
So, when he was walking in the Kensington Gardens, he made a paper boat of his banknote and sent it sailing on the serpentine. It reached the island at night, and the lookout brought it to Solomon Kaur, who thought at first that it was the usual thing, a message from a lady saying she would be obliged if he would send her a choice fledgling. What does she want? Boy or girl, fair or foul, doesn't matter which. As long as it's a good one. Open it up. There's a big five on it. <laughs> Preposterous greed. Let her wait. He tossed the paper to Peter, who recognised instantly what it was. How? Because, because he had seen one, having been very observant during the week when he was an ordinary boy, and now reflected how it might enable him to get off the island. Solomon, who was rather vain of his cleverness, was so upset at having missed out that he flew to the far end of the island and sat there very depressed with his head buried in his wings. Now Peter knew that unless Solomon was on your side, you never got anything done for you on the island. So he followed him and tried to hearten him. I'm a poor crow, Peter Pan. I have no intention of remaining in office all my life. I look forward to retiring by and by and devoting my green old age to a life of pleasure on a certain youth stump in the figs which has taken my fancy. For years I've been quietly filling my stocking. I now have 180 crumbs, 34 nuts, 16 crusts, a pen wiper and a boot lace. When my stocking is full, I will be able to retire. I'll cut off a pound worth from this note for you. This made Solomon his friend forever, and after the two had consulted together, they called a meeting of the thrushes. You'll see presently why thrushes only were invited. Ah, I have been much impressed by the superior ingenuity shown by you thrushes in nest building. <laughs> Other birds omit to line their nests with mud, and as a result, they do not hold water. <laughs> And then the thrushes stopped cheering, and Solomon was so perplexed that he took several sips of water. We build our nest to hold eggs, not water. Consider how warm the mud makes the nest. Yes, and you consider that when water gets into the nest, it stays there, and the little ones are drowned. Who's that? She's a finch. Who invited her? She's not. She should mind her own business. Yes, she's a finch. Let's give No, can't answer that, can you? You crows think you're so clever. Have another drink. Ah, if a finch's nest is placed on the serpentine, it fills and breaks to pieces. But a thrush's nest is still as dry as the cup of a swan's back. <laughs> How true. Very true. How clever we are. Hooray! 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 But we don't put our nests on the serpentine. We're not that stupid. Oh, fly away. Get off with you. We've had enough of this. Boom! Oh. Sit down, Patty. Clear off! Pitch it out! Pitch it out! What you have been brought together to hear is this. Our young friend Peter Pan, as you well know, wants very much to be able to cross to the gardens. And he now proposes, with your help, to build a boat. We knew there'd be a catch. We walked right into that. A nest for a human. Oh, no, no, no. What I mean is, not one of the great cumbrous boats that humans use, but simply one of your own magnificently built thrushes' nests, large enough to hold him. Please. Well, we're very busy. This would be a big job. What about our own nest? It's pairing time soon. Who's going to build our nest? Yeah, that's right. Can you supply the demand from the mainland? Thrush babies are always called for. Quite so, and rightly so. I shall send abroad for sparrows to lay their eggs in thrushes' nests. And, of course, Peter will not allow you to work for nothing. You must remember that he is now in comfortable circumstances. And he will pay you such wages as you have never been paid before. Peter Pan authorises me to say that you shall all be paid sixpence a day. <laughs> At last, after months of labour, the boat was finished. What about a sail? Did he have a sail? Oh, yes. Peter proudly produced a sail which he had fashioned out of his nightgown. And though it was still rather like a nightgown, it worked beautifully. And that night, the moon being full and all the birds asleep, 
he entered his coracle and departed the island. When he reached the gardens and the fairy women observed that his sail was a baby's nightgown, they straightway loved him and grieved that their laps were too small, the which I cannot explain except by saying that such is the way of women. They led him civilly to their queen, Mab, who conferred upon him the courtesy of the gardens after lockout time. And henceforth Peter could go whether he chose. So he was very happy. But... Of course he had no mother... At least, what use was she to him? I feel sorry for him. Well, don't be too sorry, for he did get a chance to revisit her. Why don't you come and visit my mother? No, David. She's always asking. Just this once, Tuesday. No. But it's her birthday. She's 26. 26? I say, she is getting on. Tell her she looks more. What? Tell her I'll come and give her a kiss when she's 52. <laughs> Sit here. I'll tell you more about Peter. As you know, Peter Pan is the fairy's orchestra. He sits in the middle of the ring, and they would never dream of having a party without him. At the princess's coming of age ball, he'd played so beautifully that Queen Mab ordered him to kneel down, and she gave him the wish of his heart. If I chose to go back to Mother, could you give me that wish? But, Your Majesty... Lord Chamberlain... If he returns to his mother, we shall lose our music. Who? Ask for a much bigger wish than that. Is that quite a little wish? As little as this. <laughs> well, what size is a big wish? As wide as my skirt. <laughs> well then, I think I shall have two little wishes instead of one big one. <laughs> so it shall be. My first wish is to go to my mother, but with the right to return to the gardens if I find her disappointing. My second wish I hold in reserve. I can give you the power to fly to her house, but I can't open the door for you. The window I flew out at will be open. Mother always keeps it open in the hope that I may fly back. How do you know? She just does. I know it. <laughs> then I grant your wish. <gasps> just for tonight, dear Peter Pan, you shall fly. <laughs> did he fly, Father? He did. How? The fairies tickled him where his wings used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a funny itching. Ready, Peter? <laughs> oh, how it, it itches. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm flying. I'm flying. Look at me. I'm flying again. I'm flying again. He enjoyed it so much that instead of going straight home, he took a long route, skimming over St Paul's to the Crystal Palace and back by the river and Regent's Park, only to land on his own windowsill. What time was it? I don't know, David. Two o'clock in the morning. All right. Mother? Mother? Asleep. I bet she was pretty. Yes. Shh, listen and picture it. Dear Mother, if only you just knew who was sitting on the rail at the foot of the bed. He's patting the mound at her feet, mate. Shh. Why doesn't he wake her up? Then she'd give out a big cry and hold him tight. Wake her, silly. Wake her, wake her. Oh, let him wake her up, Father. Please let him wake her up. Mother or window, David. Mother or window is what he's thinking. And remembering what times those had been in the gardens. Yes, but think how happy he'd make her. Oh, he doesn't think about that. He believes that the greatest treat for her is that he should do what's best for him. Dear Mother, if, if I wake you now, it will be socks on my feet, and going to school, and being a grown-up. Mm. Peter. Sleep, Mother. It's better that you sleep. Mm. I should like awfully to sail in my boat just once more. It would be so splendid to tell the birds of this adventure. And I never said goodbye properly to Solomon Crow. I bet he wishes she'd wake up now. Why won't she wake up? I promise to come back. It was two or three months before Peter took up his second wish, and that was because he dreamt his mother was crying. He knew that she was crying for him and that a hug from her splendid Peter would quickly make her smile. I wish 
I wish now to go back to mother forever and always. He was sure of it and flew all the way there without stopping. Did he give her a hug? When he got there, the window was closed. Mother? And there were iron bars on it. Mother. Mother. Don't lock me out. Mother. Oh, please. Please. Please, mother. 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 Mother, please don't lock me out. Mother. Mother. She was sleeping with her arm around another little boy. I wanted to be the most glorious, bravest, best of all boys for her. I shall never see her again, shall I? No. You shall never see her again. Please, Solomon. Not if I ask ever so much. Ah, Peter. We who have made the great mistake. How differently we should all act at the second chance. But there is no second chance. Ah! Not for most of us. When we reach the window, it is lockout time. The iron bars are up for life. William, more brandy for my friend. Certainly, sir. Another cigar? Oh, very kind. Yes, we uh, moved out of the space and bought a muse house, sir. And uh, thanks to the sale of two more paintings, I'm able to rent a tiny studio for myself. I understand you dabble in the arts yourself, a, a writer, David tells me. Oh, I've, I've published a little volume on military tactics, and I'm preparing a large one on the same subject. Oh, Mary's writing a book. Ah, some nonsense. <laughs> Make believe. <laughs> So, Irene tells me that you want to take David to the theatre. Yes, I would like that very much if you have no objection. Little Red Riding Hood, a Christmas treat. Mm -hmm. David said he wants to make an adventure of it and has begged us to allow him to stay with you. I would see that he came to no harm. Is this Red Riding Hood's house? No, dearie. This is the box office. And I'm not Red Riding Hood's granny. Why have you got very red hair? David. <laughs> father, why has she got very red hair? David. I'm sorry, he isn't really my father, but it is very red. <laughs> I like the clown best. Joey, you mean? Yes, and the sausage machine. But how did the wolf eat Red Riding Hood's grandma alive so that she could come out again? That was silly. I'd much rather have our stories. Your father tells me your mother's writing a book. Yes, she is. Why? I don't know. Look, we're coming up to the gardens. She's never written one before, has she? No, but she says it must be easy if you can do it. I see. It's way past lockout time. What's it called? The Little White Bird. Ah. I can see lights in the gardens. See? Over there. That's the little house. What's that? Everybody's heard of the little house in the Kensington Gardens, which is the only house in the whole world that the fairies have built for humans. What you see is not really it, but only the light in the windows. Mamie Mannering was the famous one for whom the house was first built. Mamie? Tell me about her. She was always rather a strange girl, but only at night. She was quite ordinary in the daytime. Why? No one knew, but when it grew dark, there came into her face a look that I can only describe as, well, as a leery look. But, of course, it was daytime when they were in the gardens, and then Tony did most of the talking. You could gather from his talk that he was a very brave boy, and no one was so proud of it as Mamie. She would have loved to have a ticket on her saying that she was his sister. One day I'm going to stay in the gardens after they close the gates. Oh, but the fairies would be so angry, I dare say. Perhaps Peter Pan will give you a sail in his boat. I shall make him, will you? Which day? Someday. Today? <gasps> yes! The lake is covered with ice and it's starting to snow. Yes, isn't it? 
take my scarf in case you should feel cold. I'm afraid Aya will see me, so maybe I shan't be able to do it. I shall race you to the gate, then you can hide. What's an Aya? It's an Indian nurse. Tony could always outdistance her easily, but never had she known him speed away so quickly as now, and she was sure he hurried that he might have more time to hide. Brave, so brave. Her doting eyes were crying when she got a dreadful shock. Instead of hiding, her hero had run out at the gate. In a swell of protest against all such feeble cowards, she ran to St. Gover's well and hid in Tony's stead. When the Aya reached the gate and saw Tony far out in front, she thought Mamie was with him and went on out. Mamie had shut her eyes tight, and when she opened them, something very cold ran up her legs and up her arms and dropped into her heart. It was the stillness of the gardens. So, that's another day over, then. I suppose it is a bit coldish up there. Not particularly, Holly, but do you get numb standing so long on one leg? I never knew trees could speak. What was that talking, Chrysanthemum? Yes, what is it? Show yourself. It's only me. Oh, hoity toity. A human. Of course, it's no affair of ours. But you know quite well you ought not to be here. And perhaps it is our duty to report you to the fairies. What do you think yourself? I think you should not. I wouldn't ask it of you if I thought it was wrong. Well, a day. Such is life. If the fairies see you, they will mischief you, stab you to death or compel you to nurse their children or turn you into something tedious like an evergreen oak. Oh, 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 listen to you. <laughs> There's nothing tedious about my oh. life. Deliciously cozy to stand here button to the neck and watch you poor naked creatures shivering without a leaf to your name. Oh. Besides, little girl, the court is not in its usual good temper at present. Oh. The Duke of Christmas Daisies, an oriental fairy, is very poorly of a dreadful complaint. He is unable to love. Oh. Queen Mab, who rules in the gardens, was confident that her girls would melt his heart. But alas, so far, the doctor says it remains cold. Tonight's ball is the last chance. Whatever you say, I am determined to see the fairy ball. Follow the ribbon and see where it gets you. <laughs> she no longer felt afraid. Why didn't she? It was now night time, and in the dark, you remember, Mamie was always rather strange. Leary? Exactly. So she moved off down the baby walk following a red ribbon lying on the snow. She came to a place where the ribbon became a bridge over a dry puddle into which a fairy had fallen. Mamie went to help her, and she soon sat in Mamie's palm, chatting gaily. Oh, my name's Brownie. I'm just a street singer on my way to the ball to see if the Duke will have me. Well, why not, I thought. And now look at me, all bepuddled and bemuddied. He'd have to be daft with me. Well, I, uh... I expect. Of course, I am rather plain. I see you think I have no chance. I don't say that. Of course, your face is just a tiny bit homely. Homely? To be homely is a good thing. Once my father went to a fashionable bazaar where all the most beautiful ladies in London were on view for half a crown the second day. But on his return home, instead of being dissatisfied with Mama, he said, You can't think, my dear, what a relief it is to see a homely face again. Really? Decidedly, and he has chosen to marry her above anyone. Then I have not the slightest doubt that the Duke will pick me. You'll see. You'd best stay here. Don't come no nearer lest the Queen see you. But Mamie's curiosity tugged her forward, and presently at the seven Spanish chestnuts she saw a wonderful sight. She crept forward until she was quite near it. 
and then she peeped from behind a tree. Next. The princess of the figs, your highness. Stand closer to the duke so that he can see you. The queen and court looked very unhappy as the duke let out a parrot-like cry of anguish. The heart is cold, quite cold. <laughs> Next. Lady Lupin, your highness. Oh. Cold, quite cold. The queen and court, though they pretended not to care, burst into tears. They were so unhappy. Fairies never say, we feel happy. They say, we feel dancey. Well... Yes, David. Well, they were feeling very undancy indeed, for none of the ladies had been able to melt the prince's heart. But then... There are no more ladies, your highness. Oh. Well, there is one more. <laughs> Step forward. <laughs> your grace, may, may I present Brownie, a street singer? <laughs> she was led forwards and the doctor put a finger on the Duke's heart. How did he do that? Through a little trapdoor in his shirt. Really? Cold, quite co What's this? <gasps> Bless my soul. <gasps> what is it? On my word. <gasps> what? <laughs> the heart is quite warm. <gasps> oh! Good gracious me. Hot. So hot. Ouch! My Lord Duke, I have the honor to inform your Excellency that your grace is in love. Oh. In love with me. <laughs> And then Mamie went and spoiled everything. Oh, no. She couldn't help it. She was crazy with delight over her little friend's good fortune, so she took several steps forward. She couldn't. Please don't let her. But she did. Oh, Brownie, how splendid. Everybody stood still. The music ceased, the lights went out, and all in the time you may take to say, Oh, dear. so friendly to Brownie and helped her to go to the ball, they would give three cheers and try to find her to help her. Good idea, David. Hurrah! 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 By following her footprints, they found Mamie covered by snow in the figs. But they couldn't thank her, for they couldn't waken her. She'll die if we don't do something. Turn her into something that doesn't mind the cold. A snowflake? Oh. Snowflakes melt. Oh. And that's when they built the house around her. Build a house around her? That's, that's the thing, thing to do. do! Of course. It. Build a veranda round. Oh, the cleverness! The very cleverness! Chimney. Now we fear it is quite finished. Smoke. That certainly finishes it. Not at all. If she were to wake without seeing a nightlight, she might be frightened. So mm. I shall be her nightlight. And, and I shall make you a saucer. Oh. Now, alas, it was absolutely finished. Gracious me! Finished at last. There's no handle on the door. A stripper. A doormat. A water butt. A green water butt. Ah. Finished at last. Oh. Finished? How can it be finished before hot and cold are put in? And the garden. Seeds, bulbs, flowers, vegetables, vegetables clematis, roses. Now, 
finished. Oh. As true as true. <laughs> Sleep well, little Mamie. On with the dance. <laughs> I know. Let us, you, Brownie and I, David, drop a sweet dream down the chimney. These are my medals. What did you win them for? Oh, plodding merit only. Didn't you get the Victoria Cross? No, David. Oh, I tell everybody in the gardens you did. Well, I didn't. Oliver Bailey's father did. Half past six, time for little boys to be in bed. And he shaves twice a day. I put your bed next to my own and there's a new ornament on the mantel shelf, especially for you. What is it? You'll see. Actually, it was a tumbler of milk with a biscuit on top of it and a chocolate on top of that. Soon, with David bathed in bed and the nursery in darkness, but for the glimmer from the nightlight, his bright eyes turned to me. Can we not have the rest of the story, Father? Just a little. Please tell me what happened to Mamie. Did she meet Peter Pan? Did she go home to her mother? Very well, I'll tell you, but then you must promise to sleep. I promise. All night long, the little house stood there in the figs, taking care of Mamie, and she never knew. When the dawn came, Mamie woke and left the house. As she did, it began to grow smaller. Oh, no. No, don't go. Perhaps a human voice frightened the little house, or maybe it now knew that its work was done, for no sooner had Mamie spoken than it vanished completely. Don't go. Oh, no. <laughs> don't cry, pretty human. I hope you've had a good night. Thank you. I was so cosy and warm, but you, don't you feel the least bit cold? I don't think so. But I may be wrong. You see, I'm not a human boy. Solomon says I'm a betwixt and between. So that's what you're called. That's not my name. My name is Peter Pan. Yes, of course. I know. Everybody knows. People outside the gates know about me. Tell me what they know. Tell me what they say. Clear away some snow and squeeze closer. What's squeeze? Like this. <laughs> Do they know that I play games exactly like real boys? Do they know how I sail my hoop on the round pond? All your ways of playing are quite, quite wrong and not in the least like real little boys play. <laughs> I shall give you a kiss if you like. But though he once knew, Peter had forgotten what kisses are and he held out his hand. Thank you. Not wishing to shame him, Mamie gave Peter a thimble which she happened to have in her pocket. Mamie's eyes glistened as Peter told her of all his adventures especially of how he went to and fro between the islands and the gardens in his thrush's nest. How romantic. I suppose all human boys would have done that. Never, never. My brother Tony would have been afraid. What is afraid? I do wish you'd teach me how to be afraid. I believe no one could teach you that. You're ever so much the bravest boy I ever knew. Huh? And if you want very much to give me a kiss, you can do it. Peter reluctantly offered her the thimble. I didn't mean a kiss. I mean a thimble. What's that? It's like this. I should love to give you a thimble. <laughs> Mamie, will you marry me? I should like to, but is there room on your boat for two? If you squeeze close. Perhaps the birds would be angry. <laughs> the birds would love to have you. Besides, there are very few birds in winter. Of course, they might want your clothes. What? All birds ever think about is their nests, and there are some bits of you, like this fur on your collar, that would get them very excited. They're not having that. No, no. Do you know why I love you? It's because you are like a beautiful nest. You're speaking more like a bird than a boy now, and you even look like one, a betwixt and between. Yes, I am. It must be a delicious thing to be. Well, why don't you come and be one, then? You're not a bit like a nest. But I think it's rather nice to be a nest. And though I can't give them my fur, I wouldn't mind their building in it. Of course, I shall go and see Mother often, quite often. It's not as if I was saying goodbye forever to Mother. He's not in the least like that. 
I won't come unless I know for certain I can go back whenever I want to. Really? Peter, say it. You can go back to your mother whenever you choose, if you are sure your mother will always want you. The very idea of mother not always wanting me. If she doesn't bar you out. The door will always, always be open, and mother will always be waiting at it for me. Then step in, if you feel so sure of her. Step into the thrush's nest. But why won't you look at me? What is it, Peter? It isn't fair to take you with me if you think you can go back. Mothers, you don't know them as well as I do. Maybe not anybody's mother. Yes, she would. They're all the same. But my mother, my mother... I dare say she's looking for another one already. I can't believe it. Besides, my mother has Tony, and surely they're satisfied when they have one. You should see the letters Solomon gets from ladies who have six, all asking for more. What if I'm too late? Oh, Peter, what if she's got another one already? I'll come and look for you tonight. But if you hurry away, I think you'll be in time. A last thimble. I'll always be here. Mamie! What a tremendous adventure. Are you never to fall asleep, David? When are you going to bed? Oh, when the nightlight burns down. When little boys are in bed, there is nothing between them and bears and wolves but the nightlight. I returned to my chair to think, and at last he fell asleep with his face to the wall. Long after I had gone to my bed, a sudden silence filled the room, and I knew that David had awakened. Irene? Irene's not here. You're sleeping at my home tonight, you know, David. I didn't know. You remember you're with me. I nearly remember. I remember now. The windows won't be barred from me, will they? Of course not. Decidedly not. You're not frightened, are you? Not now. Occasionally, during the night, he woke me to say that he was still there. I could not sleep. I lay thinking of this little boy who sometimes called me father by mistake, of his mother who had let me be part of his life, of how I had stood by the open door listening to his breathing, had stood so long that I forgot his name and called him Timothy. On attaining the age of eight or thereabouts, children disappear from the gardens and never come back. When next you meet them, they are ladies and gentlemen holding up umbrellas to hail a hansom. The girls go to some private place, I suppose, to put up their hair, and the boys go to Pilkington's. I first heard of Pilkington's from David, who had it from Oliver Bailey. He's a man with a cane. You may not go to Pilkington's in knickerbockers made by your mother. No, they must be real knickerbockers. It's an absolute rule, isn't it, Captain Wallace? Good afternoon, sir. And you are? I am Oliver Bailey. Oliver's father shaves twice a day. So I've heard. David was top-heavy with pride in his new friend. For years I'd been fighting Mary for David and had not wholly failed. Was I now to be knocked out so easily by a seven-year-old who no longer believed in fairies? nor the children were once birds. I reconsidered my weapons, and I fought Oliver, and I beat him. These two boys became as faithful to me as my coattails, and it was with wrecked islands I did it. It started as the wreck of a simple Swiss family who looked up and saw the butter tree, but soon a glorious inspiration of the night turned it into the wreck of David and Oliver Bailey. They were wrecked, and found me among the breakers with a large dog. I was the sole survivor of the ill-fated Anna Pink. At first it was what they were to do when they were wrecked, but imperceptibly it became what they had done. As we walked in the gardens, I told them of the hut they had built, and they were inflated but not surprised. On the other hand, they looked for surprise from me. Did we tell you about the eggs we found in the sand? Asked Oliver, reverting to deeds of theirs which I had previously told them. You did. Who found them? They were found by David, the younger of the two youths. Who stabbed the wild pig? Oliver Bailey. Was it Oliver?
discover that found the coconut tree first? On the contrary, it was first observed by David, who immediately climbed it, remarking, This is certainly the Cocos nucifera, for see, dear Oliver, the slender columns supporting the crown of leaves which fall with a grace that no heart can imitate. That's what I said. I said things like that too. No, you didn't then. Yes, I did so. No, you didn't so. Shut up. Well then, let's hear one you said. The following is one that Oliver said. Truly, dear comrade, though the perils of these happenings are great and our privations calculated to break the stoutest heart, yet to be rewarded by such fair sights, I would endure still greater trials and still rejoice, even as the bird on yonder bough. I shot the bird. What bird? The yonder bird. No, you didn't. Did I not shoot the bird? It was David who shot the bird, but it was Oliver who saw by its multicoloured plumage that it was one of the Cetacidae, an excellent substitute for partridge. You didn't see that. Yes, I did. What did you see? I saw that... the city thing. What? Oh, you shut up. David shot it and Oliver knew its name, but I ate it. Do you remember how hungry I was? Rather. I cooked it. It was served up on toast. I toasted it. When I had finished my repast, you amazed me by handing me a cigar from the tobacco plant. I handed it. I snicked off the end. And then you gave me a light. Which of us? Both of you. Never shall I forget my amazement when I saw you get the light by striking two stones together. You couldn't have done it. No, David, I can't do it. But of course I know that all wrecked boys do it quite easily. Thus many months passed with no word of Pilkington. And you may be asking where he was all this time. Ah, my friends, he was very busy fishing, though I was as yet unaware of his existence. Most suddenly... I heard the whir of his hated reel as he struck a fish. The fish was Oliver. I remember that grim day with perfect vividness. It was a wet day. Indeed, I think it has rained for me more or less ever since. Oliver is going to Pilkington's. I hope he won't swish you, Oliver. He has two jackets and two shirts and two knickerbockers, all real ones. Well done, Oliver. He doesn't want you to call him Oliver anymore. What shall I call him? Bailey. But why? He's going to Pilkington's. David, are you going to Pilkington's? When I am eight. And shan't I call you David then? And won't you play with me in the gardens anymore? Oh, no. Thus sharply did I learn how much longer I was to have of him. Strange that a little boy can give so much pain. I dropped his hand and walked on in silence and presently I did my most churlish to hurt him by ending his story in a very cruel way. Ten years have elapsed since I last spoke, and our two heroes, now dashing young men, are revisiting the wrecked island of their childhood. Did we wreck ourselves, or was there someone to help us? I think there was someone to help us. A man with a dog. I think he used to tell me stories in the Kensington Gardens, but I forget all about him. I don't remember even his name. This tame ending bored Bailey, and he drifted away from us. But David still walked by my side, and he was grown so quiet that I knew a storm was brewing. Suddenly he flashed lightning on me. It's not true. It's a lie. I shan't never forget you, Father. You will forget, David. But there was once a boy who would have remembered. Timothy. That's who you meant, isn't it? Timothy. (laughs) I'm sorry. I beg your pardon, David. Please forgive me. I made it all right with him and had him laughing and happy again before I let him go. But nevertheless, what I said was true. David is not my boy, and he will forget. But Timothy would have remembered. When Oliver disappeared from the life of the gardens, we had lofted him out of the story and did very well without him. We had occasionally considered the giving of Bailey's place to some other child of the gardens, divers of David's year having sought election even with bribes. And then said David one day, Shall we let Barbara in? Who is she? She's my sister. She hasn't come yet, but she is coming. Many months ago, when David blurted out the title of his mother's book, I was like one who had read the book to its last page. I knew at once that the white bird was the little daughter Mary would rather have had. 
Somehow from the doll's house onwards I had always known that she would like to have a little girl. She was that kind of woman, and so long as she had the modesty to see that she could not have one, I sympathised with her deeply. What's happened with your mother's book? Is it finished yet? She's not writing it any more. Isn't she? Why not? I don't know. From that moment all my sympathy with Mary was spilled, and I searched for some means of exulting over her until I found it. It was this. I decided, unknown even to David, to write the book, The Little White Bird, of which she had proved herself incapable, and then when in the fullness of time she held her baby daughter on high, implying that she had accomplished a major achievement, I was to hold up the book. I ventured to think that such a devilish scheme was never before planned and carried out. Yes, carried out, for this is the book, rapidly approaching completion. She and I are running a neck-and-neck -neck race. I have also once more brought the story of David's adventures to an abrupt end. And it really is the end this time, David. You always say that. This is definitely the end. Where are we, then? We were on the coast of Patagonia. I can't quite remember why. We had gone to shoot the Great Great Sloth. I've read all about it. It is known to be the largest of animals. Though we found his size to have been underestimated. Oh, yes. It was huge. You, your father and I had flung our limbs upon the beach and were having a last pipe before turning in, while your mother, attired in barbaric splendour, sang and danced before us. Mother can't sing. She could this night. It was a lovely evening, and we lolled man-like, gazing well content at the pretty creature. The night was absolutely still. But we could hear the roaring of the sloths. <laughs> could we not? Yes, now you mention it, I think we could. Everything conduced to repose, and a feeling of gentle peace crept over us, from which we were roused by a shrill cry. It was uttered by Irene, who came speeding to us, bearing certain articles which she had discovered in the interior of the shark. What shall we say was in it? A pair of boots. Yes. An alarm clock. Tick, tack, tick, tack. Something tick, more special tack, than that. Tick, tack, uh, give me a hint. What's black and white and red all over? Uh, no, you've asked me that before. A newspaper. Indeed, a newspaper with intelligence of the utmost importance to all of us. It was nothing less than this. The birth of a new baby in London to Mary, your mother. So she had to get back straight away. Indeed. How strange a method had Solomon chosen of sending us the news. We plunged into a fever of excitement and next morning we set sail for England. Soon we came within sight of the white cliffs of Albion. Mary could not sit down for a moment, so hot was she to see her child. She paced the deck in uncontrollable agitation. So did I. On arriving at the docks, we immediately hailed a cab. Never, David, shall I forget your mother's excitement. I know. She kept putting her head out of the window, didn't she? Definitely. And calling, quicker, quicker, quicker. How the driver lashed his horse. At last he drew up at your house, and then your mother, springing out, flew up the steps and beat with her hands upon the door. The key, father has the key. He opened the door, and your mother rushed in, and next moment, her Benjamin was in her arms. Barbara. Benjamin. Is that a girl's name? No, it's a boy's name. But mother wants a girl. Just like her to be presumptuous. It's to be a boy, David, and you can tell her I said so. Barbara. Benjamin. Oh, please. I'll play you for it. A two innings match in the figs. If you win, it will be a girl, and if I win, it will be a boy. There were no spectators of our contest, except now and again some loiterer in the gardens, who little thought what was the stake for which we played. But imagine Barbara standing at the ropes and anxiously ripping up the daisies every time David missed the ball. I tell you, this was the historic match of the gardens. And I shall say at once that David won with two lovely fours, the first one over my head and the other to leg, all along the ground. And that is how we let Barbara in. The Dedication to My Book Madam, I have no desire to exult over you, yet I should show a lamentable obtuseness to the irony of things were I not to dedicate this little work to you. For its inception was yours. And in your more ambitious days, you thought to write the tale of the little white bird yourself. 
Why you so early deserted the nest is not for me to inquire. It now appears that you were otherwise occupied. In fine, madam, you chose the lower road and contented yourself with obtaining the bird. May I point out, by presenting you with this dedication, that in the meantime, I... But I have come. It is the story, ma'am, of your whole life. Please, take a chair. And so, as you would not come... To me to be thanked, I have come to you to thank you. Oh, ma'am. I'm not very strong yet. When you're quite done, ma'am, perhaps you will allow me to say a word. If I have done all this for you, why did I do it? I thought maybe because you... Not a bit of it, ma'am. That was not the reason at all. I never said it was. I never thought for a moment that it was. Besides, I don't know what you are talking of. David, did you ever see your mother blush? What is blush? She goes a beautiful pink colour. I don't, David. I think she will do it now. Oh, Mother, do it again. You see, I can forgive even that. After all you have done for us, you long ago earned the right to make me blush if you want to. And I did think that for a little while. Think what? What we were talking of. If I once thought that, it was pretty to me while it lasted, and it lasted but a little time. I have long been sure that your kindness to me was due to some other reason. Ma'am, I know not what was the reason. My concern for you was, in the beginning, a very fragile and even a selfish thing, yet not altogether selfish. For I think that what first stirred it was the joyous sway of the little nursery governess as she walked down Pall Mall to meet her lover. It seemed such a mighty fine thing to you to be loved that I thought you'd better continue to be loved for a little longer, and perhaps having helped you once by dropping a letter... I was charmed by the ease with which you could be helped and so continued to do so. For I must tell you that I am one who has chosen the easy way and lived without love for more than twenty years. Oh, no. On my soul, I can think of no other reason. A kind heart. More like a whim. Or another woman. Ah. More than twenty years ago. Why, Mum, it is a pretty notion and there may be something in it. Let us leave it at that. If only you'd been less ambitious. I wanted all the dear, delicious things. It was unreasonable, especially this last thing. Yes, I know. But I got it. I have not deserved it, but I got it. Oh, ma'am, reflect. You have not got the great thing. I saw her counting the great things in her mind. Her wondrous husband and his obscure success. David, Barbara, and the other trifling contents of her jewel box. I think I have. Come, madam. You know that there is lacking the one thing you crave for most of all. The book. The book? I had forgotten all about the book. <laughs> See this? What is it? It is a dedication. How characteristic of you. Characteristic? Ha! Huh. And how kind. Did you say kind, ma'am? But it is I who have the substance, and you who have the shadow, as you know very well. And there is another mistake. Excuse me, ma'am, but that is the only one. It was never of my little white bird I wanted to write. It was of your little white bird. It was a little boy whose name was Timothy. She had a very pretty way of saying Timothy. So taking the manuscript of this poor book with her to read, she left David and I, arranging to meet me an hour later in the Kensington Gardens. How wrong you are, Captain Wallace, in thinking that the book is about me and mine. It is really all about Timothy. And so, it proves to be my book after all. With all your pretty thoughts left out. I had only one pretty thought for the book. I was to give it a happy ending. The little white bird was to bear an olive leaf in its mouth. For a long time she talked to me earnestly of a grand scheme on which she had set her heart to invite me to her tea parties and meet her lady friends. I listened respectfully, smiling at this young thing for carrying it so motherly to me. And in the end, I had to remind her that I was 47 years of age. It is quite young for a man. My father was not 47 when he died, and I remember thinking him an old man. But you don't think so now, do you? You feel young occasionally, don't you? Sometimes when you're playing with David in the gardens, your youth comes swinging back, does it not? Mary, I forbid you to make any more discoveries today. They're very dear women. I'm sure they must be dear women if they're friends of yours. They're not exactly young, and perhaps they're not very pretty. But she had been reading so recently about the darling of my youth that she halted, abashed at last, feeling, I apprehend, 
a stop in her mind against proposing this thing to me, who in these presumptuous days had thought to be content with nothing less than the loveliest lady in all the land. Very well, ma'am. I'll come to your tea parties, and we'll see what we shall see. In twenty years, Mary, a man grows humble, and I have stored within me a great fund of affection with nobody to give it to. And I swear to you, on the word of a soldier, that if there is one of those ladies who can be got to care for me, I shall be very proud. Despite her semblance of delight, I knew that she was wondering at me, and I wondered at myself. But it was true. We must go. Peter. That was the Little White Bird by J. M. Barry. Dramatized for radio by John Peacock. The part of Captain Wallace was played by Michael Siberry, and Peter Pan by Joe Absalom. David Thomas Glenister, Solomon Kaur Philip Voss, the father Chris Pavlo, Mary Sarah Markland, William Hicking Daniel Ryan, Mrs Hicking Becky Hindley, Irene Hicking Robin Weaver, Mamie Gabriella Smith, Tony Matthew Thomas Davis. Ellen Polly Adams, Elm Sam Dale, Mr. Beecher Keith Drinkle, and Oliver Bailey was played by Thomas Anderson. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The panpipe music was composed and played by Simon De Sorge. The piano was played by Margaret Vincent. The violins by Hannah Vincent and Patrick Sabaton, and the songs were sung by the Oakfield Preparatory School Choir. The Little White Bird was directed by Celia De Wolf and was a peer production for BBC Radio Four.